Good evening, frats and soror, friends. Um, it's great to be with you guys tonight uh, in the house of the Lord where we get to spend some time, as Brother Daniel was saying, uh, making much of Jesus and learning through the scriptures how to live a life more pleasing to the Lord. I have a message on my heart tonight. It's going to be on wisdom. Um, I've been thinking about this concept for a couple months now, this idea of biblical wisdom. And I think it's so, um, obviously it's kind of been birthed out of this unique uh, pandemic that we've been living through. In my lifetime, at least, I've never experienced something like this. And one of the things that I've noticed so clearly is that wisdom is lacking. Uh, in our personal lives, uh, many of us probably thought, oh, pandemic's here, less work, less time outside the house. I'm gonna read all those Bible books. I'm gonna read all those uh, godly books. I'm gonna, I'm gonna catch up on some stuff that I've put off. And maybe like me, you realized crisis doesn't create character, it just reveals your character. Just showed, at least in my part, that I really didn't wanna read those books to the degree I thought I did. Uh, we've seen a lack of wisdom on a local level. You know, we all have gripes with our government, local and national. And we've seen their, their conflicting accounts, their lack of clarity, their lack of ability to guide us through this pandemic, maybe successfully. Wisdom has been lacking. And what a time we needed wisdom. What a time we would have benefited maybe in our personal lives, maybe in our national, in our local lives, uh, socially. We would have done good to have more wisdom. We would have done good to have more wisdom. And I think that's unique for us as those, well, for maybe, you know, some of you younger kids, uh, you know, the kids of the church, if I can call you that, teens, young people, call yourself what you will. Um, maybe you guys don't know Jesus. Maybe you guys don't love him, you know. Uh, but, you know, this, this thing, this is a, my sermon tonight for us, not just for you young folks, but for everybody here who understands the words coming out of my mouth. Uh, my hope is that we would take seriously the invitation of Jesus. And if we haven't made a decision for Christ, if we haven't accepted the reality of our soul's need for a Savior, that we would choose tonight to put down our pride. Like you don't have it all together. And we're going to talk about that a little bit. But for us as the people of God, wisdom is something that should be ours. And there could probably be a sermon three times as long as what I'm going to speak tonight, hopefully in succinct and, and short words. Um, about what wisdom is, how we can treasure, how we can value, how can we incorporate, how we can enjoy wisdom as Christians. But one of the things that's so clear, that one of the things I want us to know is that as people of God, we are called to exhibit the wisdom of God in the place that we're set. Here in Kenmore, Washington, or whatever city you're coming from, in the greater Seattle area, as a people of God, we have a mandate to be people of wisdom and to manifest that wisdom in the society that we dwell in. And we have to do that. And we're just going to kind of go into scripture, just some things that I think are really important for us to note. Uh, in, in, when, uh, when Moses gives the people, he kind of hands off, you know, he gives the stafeta to Joshua. He hands over the reins, so to speak. In Deuteronomy, there's this uh, great exchange of, of wisdom. Uh, Moses is saying stuff. Joshua is saying stuff. But there's this great verse. And if you can turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 4, and we're going to read just verse 6. There's this really great verse here. I'm going to be reading from the NLT edition, so if it's a little different, uh, cool. It's just going to be the ways. Obey them, right? Talking about Moses is urging Israel at this time, right, towards the end of his life. Hey, guys, I want you to hold fast to this covenant. Hey, remember the God who brought you out? Remember the God who delivered you in spite of the fact that you were all babies when you left? Because remember, the older generation had died out. He's urging them to obey the Lord. And it says here in 6, obey them, right? these statutes and laws completely, and you will display your wisdom and intelligence among the surrounding nations. When they hear all these decrees, when they, hear, when they see the wisdom there, oh, I lost my train of thought, <laughs> there it is, they will exclaim, how wise and prudent are the people of this great nation. So from thousands of years ago, when Israel was wandering around, that was what God had intended, right? That his people would be a people holding fast the truth, holding fast to his ways, so that when the nations would encounter them, they'd say, wow, what a wise and prudent people these are. They are living in wisdom. And we know from the New Testament writings in James chapter 3-ish, yeah, James chapter 3, that there is, uh, there's two types of wisdom, right? James lets us know very clearly. Uh, and he says that there's a wisdom in, in chapter 3, verse 14 and 15, and also in verse 17 and 18, respectively, right? That earthly wisdom, there's this 
form of earthly wisdom that's not from above. This is not the wisdom that comes from God. This is in self a selfish and it's a ambitious wisdom that doesn't consider other people. But what is the wisdom from heaven? Just a couple verses later, he talks very clearly, he shows us there that it's a pure type of wisdom. It's a peaceable, it's a gentle type of wisdom. And a couple other adjectives there, descriptors there that show us as the people of God that there, not only is wisdom beneficial for us, not, sh not only should we exemplify it, not only should it mark the people of God, just starting in the old covenant, right? The old has been replaced with the new. We're continuing the legacy of Abraham of obedience to God and his commandments. But it's also, there's this great distinguisher. There's earthly wisdom, there's or as James might say in one translation, demonic wisdom, it's a demonic thing. And then there's the wisdom that comes from God himself, that we, as the people of God, we want to exhibit that. I mean, I hope we do. I hope it's more than a care, like an afterthought, like a, like a simmering pot in the back of our minds. That we, we just we kind of want wisdom, it's cool, we'll, we'll take care of it, we'll, we'll deal with it later. And, and not only that, um, Proverbs does a great job of kind of showing us some themes about wisdom, right? Proverbs 1 through 9 tells us so clearly this idea of like how wonderful wisdom is, how, how, how useful it is for life, for relationships, for personal, for social, for domestic or national. It, it nurtures, it protects, it cares for. And there's a, I want to read just from Proverbs 3, just kind of this, of all the first nine chapters, I felt like this was just like a really succinct passage from Scripture, and uh, I'm going to read from 13. It's Proverbs 3, verse 13 through 18. If you have your Bibles, it's really great. Follow along. If not, here we go. Joyful is the person who finds wisdom, the one who gains understanding. For wisdom is more profitable than silver, and her wages are better than gold. Wisdom is more precious than rubies. Nothing you desire can compare with her. She offers you long life in her right hand, and riches and honor in her left. She will guide you down delightful paths and all her ways are satisfying. Wisdom is a tree of life to those who embrace her. Happy are those who hold her tightly. What a thing wisdom is. What a reality for us to consider to, that the Lord has given us this opportunity just to kind of make a stop as believers in our lives, whatever age we're at, whatever emotional state we're at, whatever level of fear or not fear during this pandemic, he has invited us through many times in this last six months of pandemic or whatever we want to call it, to be wise. And, and tonight I hope that we can just focus. I hope we can allow as David pray that the Holy Spirit would teach us something. I'm going to tell you right now, I'm not the wisest person I know. I'm not even in the top 10% or the bottom. I feel like I'm at the bottom of the pile. And so I hope tonight the Holy Spirit will use the words that I kind of, he's kind of put on my heart regarding wisdom and it'll help you. It'll help you, believer, who cares. You, believer, who loves the Lord. You, believer, like we just sang that song. I, I get flashbacks to Romania, singing them to the frats and the satur, wamini carvinal de pistrada, just people who didn't know the Lord. And what a truth we just sang. So for you, believer, who is here tonight, let's, let's, let's allow the Lord to speak to us tonight about wisdom. See, one of the things that Paul writes in Romans chapter 1, and it's so evident to us now in a sense, Paul writes like, and though they were professing to be wise, they became foolish and worshipped idols, right? I think it's chapter 1, verse 22, 23, right before the long list of ugly, as I call it, of ugly sins, how it manifests. And, and, and as I said at the beginning, what a time, what a way that we could copy-paste that reality to today, <laughs> That so many people today profess to be wise. We have, uh, we've, we've been in the Enlightenment since the 1700s. We have the new age of philosophers and reasoners and people that have thought deeply about things. We, we have this, and, and, the, and one of the ways that I see this most interesting in our lives, it, there was this promise in the 60s and 70s that kind of got told to the nations of the West, at least. You know, do what makes you feel right, and you'll be true to yourself, in modern day term, for you younger kids, you do you, right? Ten years ago, it was uh, you only live once phrase. Today, it's you do you. What, what's another? I wrote another one. I wrote another one. Yeah, your truth. Hey, man, I don't know why you're talking to me like that, but my truth is my truth, and I, I'm pretty good. I'm, I'm good with my truth. <laughs> And it's so interesting that these people professing to be wise, professing to, to find a way to thrive, to live, to live their most authentic life now. It's the generation that's the most depressed, 
the most hedonistic and the most unstable when it comes to their emotional and mental health. It's, 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 it's tragic, right? They started worshiping. We live in a generation where people started worshiping the self. And what have they gotten out of it? They're the most, it's, it's, it's troubling. You guys, we see, we see it creaky, like we see it leaking out in society, right? We all, Seattle here, right? The, 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 the protests in downtown Portland and their madness over there. Because people are scrambling to find this fulfillment at the end of the day. They're trying to, they, 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 were, they believe this lie, they believe this idol, and it didn't deliver. So they're looking for the next thing. They're looking for the next thing. And until God comes, my friends, that's what it's going to be. We're going to live in the midst of a generation that will keep seizing any sort of shred of, of purpose and meaning. And you know, one of the things for us as Christians I find so interesting is that we have this unique position, Right? We have this unique place where we have access to wisdom, as we're going to see in the scriptures. We as believers, we actually have access to that pure, gentle, and kind wisdom that comes from above. We not only have access to that, but we're also, we have to keep in mind that though we have access to that wisdom, this wisdom that is not like the world's wisdom, we don't automatically get it as pokeits, to use I'm sorry, my head is Romanian and English. It's not going to be pretty sometimes when I preach. Forgive me. Like, we don't get automatic, like, we, it's, not like, it's not like paying to get into, I don't know, Chuck E. Cheese, if that's still a thing. I don't know what you young people do. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, adults, I don't know. Like, it's not like a Costco membership, right? You have access to all the deals. There you go. We all love Costco, thank God. You know, it's like, we, we as a people of God, if we want wisdom... We can't just say, man, I'm pokeit, wisdom's coming, wisdom's on its way, I'm fine. We can't be negligent about it. We can't be negligent about wisdom because it's not automatically ours, right? That's, that's one of the things that we see so often in our community or community of faith, maybe not Romanian community. You know, there's a lot of people who think, man, I, I read my scriptures daily, I go to the church, I, uh, I do some deeds, I sing some songs, I don't hate my democratic neighbors. I'm a wise person. Or I'm, man, I'm definitely on the road. I, I'm not, I don't know what I am, but I'm not bad. My friends, the devil comes to church more than us. He knows the Bible better than us. He's so good that he's been an angel of light. He has portrayed himself as an angel of light time and time again, wrapped up in all sorts of beautiful things, kind things, moralistic things. So we have to, dis we, I want us, I know maybe this seems trivial to say, but like we have to dispel this thing of just because we move within the community of believers, just because we are people who read the scriptures and do all the other things. Now your heart, we're going to talk about that later. We'll get to that. Maybe you do it with a good intention. Praise the Lord. That's good. But young guy, young gal, you know, maybe you're not a Christian. Maybe you're 15. Maybe you're 20. Maybe you're 40. Maybe you're 12. I don't know who the youngest person is here who understands me. So just being here doesn't make you a good person. Being here doesn't make you a wise person. In the same way that there's probably a lot of dumb people hanging out with the smartest people in government today. Well, we've kind of seen that in all, in all honesty, the irony of that. Being around smart people, being around wisdom doesn't make you wise by default. We're not sponges. We don't just absorb wisdom. We don't absorb characteristics. I've been around my dad for many years. If that was the way it worked, I would be a lot smarter than I am today. I'd be a lot more wise than I am today, but I'm not, and nor are you. Nor are you. You know, so we got to dispel. we got to dispel this idea about wisdom. Secondly, there's people who just want to look wise without putting in any real work. You know, a lot of people in our community are tradespeople. They work with their hands to some degree. Patilan Chaput, and now you moved into another business. But <sighs> there is a difference when you work with somebody that knows cum sa sapa si sa there's a difference between somebody who knows what they're doing and somebody who's a helper, okay? In life, as I learned with my, my father, my dad made me work, which is praise the Lord. I, I picked up some of his uh, voyance for work. He, I was always his helper. If Tati has a project to this day, I'm telling you, I'm not the smart one between the two of us. He's the guy who actually knows what he's doing. I'm the guy who's just, here's a hammer, here's some lemon, here's some kuya. I'll, I'll move all the beton, you know? The reality is, is that there are some people who, like, actually know what they're doing, actually doing it, and there's people who don't. They just kind of look like they know what they're doing. They're there for the ride. There's a lot of people who, 
hang out with wise people who give off a pretentiousness. They give like this idea, like I'm a wise person. They, they wrap themselves in spiritual things, in spiritual-esque, asha, spiritual-esque, you know? And they just, they seem wise, you know? Maybe they, I mean, I know for my generation, it's like, oh man, I listen to this preacher or that podcast. I, I read this newspaper. I don't know what, I don't know what that looks like for you guys, Fratzi my verse. I don't know how you show off to one another that you're more pokeit or more wise. I'm not that wise. But we got to dispel. We got to get away from that. So I, I just hope we can look now into the scriptures, like what does a wise person look like, right? A wise person is not someone who just comes to church, not just somebody who reads the Bible, not just somebody who does good deeds, gives money, shows up, not alone. What's a wise person look like? Matthew chapter 7, verses 24 through 27. If anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it, wait, oh, excuse me, hmm, wrong way of expressing. Anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it is wise. Like a person who builds a house on solid rock. Though the rain comes in torrents and the floodwaters rise and the winds beat against that house, it won't collapse because it is built on bedrock. But anyone who hears my teaching, Jesus says here, and doesn't obey it is foolish. Like a person who builds a house on sand. When the rains and floods come and the winds beat against the house, it will collapse with a mighty crash. There's the person who listens, who hears what Jesus has to say, what does that wise person, what does, that wise person do? What, what does wisdom show itself to be? A person who listens and does. Listens and does. As Brother David was praying under the wisdom of the Holy Spirit just a couple minutes ago. But not just people who hear, but people who do. People who are actively engaged with what has been heard. Right? And, and you know yourself, Frate Sora. You who are a Christian, you've seen this in your own life in so many ways. You know that place where you have success and spiritual discipline, a, a love for the Lord in some way, like where you see yourself abounding in spiritual life, it's that place where you've chosen the way of wisdom. You've chosen to take the truth that Jesus has taught us or his apostles gave us through the Holy Spirit, right? Many things Jesus wanted to say, but he couldn't say them all at the time he was on earth, so he gave it to the apostles through the Holy Spirit. That's why we have the rest, right? The epistles. It's you took the truth and you started doing something with it. And it's the same way with the failure in your life, Christian. We call it slabichuna. We call it many things. But it's a failure to hear and to do. And that's why we always slip. That's why we always, we, we, we aim for accomplishment. We're always moving away because at the heart of it, we're not actually trying to obey. There's a, there's a sin problem there. There is a heart problem there. And we're going to talk about that in just a bit. See, Jesus' life teaching, Jesus' teaching, the apostles' teaching us covers A to Z of what it means to be human. It talks about anger, it talks about money, it talks about marriage, it talks about ministry, it talks about family, it talks about pride, it talks about how to respect one another, how to be kind to one another, how to love one another. All these things. And, like we, and we know what the scripture says, right? John 14, 14, 23. There's this beautiful text here that, that's for us that we need to... Man, I, I, again, I'm preaching to myself here tonight, Frats, Yusuro, my friends. I'm preaching to myself. 1423, what does it say? Wow, well, wrong page. Jesus replied, <clears throat> All who love me will do what I say. My Father will love them, and we will come and make our home with each of them. Like, we know what that's like as Christians, right? In the areas that we have heard and done, Jesus has made his home with us. The, the work of the Holy Spirit, the, the, the sense in our hearts, that fullness of life that we sense in our persons. Christ is with me. And then there's other, there's other areas. There are those things that we're still not resolving, those things that we're still not giving over to the Lord, those things we're still not listening. We'll hear, we'll gather a lot of knowledge about how to fix the things, but we won't actually do it. And the Lord have mercy on us for that. May God rebuke us for that, really. Yeah, it's like I said earlier, like few people want to pay the price. It takes a really dedicated person to know how to put down a temelia buna, to build a house, you know? Any of you guys who have worked with your hands or worked at anything, like you didn't fall into your job and your proficiency and your ability, you know? Young guys and gals, I, I hate to say it, like the reason why you're so good at electronics, it's not because you saw a 20-minute video on YouTube. It's because you do it every day. So you know how to use that 
18 millionth, whatever device you have in your pocket or at home. You don't fall into these things. We have to practice. We have to give ourselves over to them. One of the things that, one of the things that I, uh, I've been thinking about is a, is a, is a, is a proverb, um, Proverbs 24, verses 3 and 4. A house is built by wisdom and becomes strong through good sense. Through knowledge, its rooms are filled with all sorts of precious riches and valuables. A lot of us come to church and we hear a lot about God. We come, we go to Bible studies, we listen to sermons, we absorb the wisdom of God, and they are like the knowledge that the devil has about the things of faith. And to, to use this parable, this, uh, this example that Zach Poon and I heard long ago, he said, you know, how foolish would it be a person to take all this furniture, mobula, refrigerator, A to Z, all the things you need to furnish a house. And we all have houses or, or apartments or condos here. So we kind of know what goes into a building and how foolish it would be to throw that all in a strip of land and be like, this is my house. This is my place. This is home. Without a temelia, without walls, without a koperish, without rooms, by wisdom, a house is built, the scriptures tells us. The application of the commandments of God through the power of the Holy Spirit into deeds of faith that are empowered by the Holy Spirit alone. Some of us are really comfortable, maybe I, I, I'll speak for myself, I, in many ways or little ways, whatever you want to call it, in ways have been comfortable with a pile of furniture, a metaphorical pile of furniture on a plot. Sorry. Like, that's, and we're okay with that. And that's tragic. <laughs> because God doesn't want us to be like the people who lose their house every time it floods. God's purpose for us is not to give up, not to, not to stumble, not to, what, not stumble, what's the word? Not to have to rebuild a house every time a storm comes. That's a better way to put it. Not to have to rebuild every time. Because so many of us are okay with that. So many are okay with that. I don't know. You have to ask yourselves, Frate Sutter, are you like are there places where you're allowing the devil to come back every two months, every three months, and destroy what he's the Lord's been trying to do? Have you been just kind of putting it off, just leaving it alone? Why? Why? Because it's good to know things about the Lord, but if we're not wise, he's a darnik, right? As the apostle writes. It's like, you, you, you really want to be a Christian? Do you, or maybe it's a better way to say it this way. Are you a Christian who's just okay with every two months redoing it all again, having to start back, never really growing, never really building the house and filling it in with all the beautiful things of Scripture, all the beautiful things we know about God? Don't tell me about all the verses tied to sanctification if you're not willingly engaging in sanctification. Don't quote to me verses on the doctrine of the Holy Spirit, my friend, if you don't know how to love the Lord rightly, if you're not building a house that stands. I'm not saying this to insult you. I'm saying this to, to put forward the drasticness of what's happening at times. We're okay with knowledge, but we don't want wisdom because it costs us. It takes work. You got to actually learn what to do with it. You got to submit yourself to the wisdom of the Holy Spirit and the power of the Holy Spirit. Not your own earthly wisdom, but you got to accept the wisdom from on high and the power of the Spirit that's trying to manifest that. And who likes to be told... I'm your boss. The good news is, my friends, and I'll, I'll kind of close here. I, I apologize. I'm, I'm a little over time. Um, the good news is that James chapter 1, verse 5, it tells us a beautiful thing about those who lack wisdom tonight. Because I have a feeling that it's not just me who lacks, lacks some wisdom tonight on how to live their lives effectively. James 1, verse 5. If you need wisdom, ask our generous God and he will give it to you. He will not rebuke you for asking. <laughs> you know, so many things I worry about, like if I ask the Lord for something, like if God's just gonna be like, but like your nenselep, touch ningura, you know, like metaphorically, right? Maybe not, I don't wanna hear that voice, that'd be terrifying. But like I fear, like sometimes I fear, like my prayers are zadanik, like man, I don't even know if I'm, I don't even know how to pray this right. Maybe the Lord's not even gonna listen to this because I, I, I'm asking with some like subconscious wrong intent. I'm not sure if I'm actually pure of heart. You want to know a prayer that you can pray and the Lord's not really upset? Like, it's almost a like guaranteed he's not going to get upset at you. God, I need wisdom. God, I need wisdom. You always wonder maybe what you need to pray. Maybe when you don't have anything to pray. You need wisdom, my friend. 
Because maybe you who are married, you have a spouse, you have children, or you have responsibilities towards one another. If you're a young person who's not married, you have the future to think about. It's the job you want to take. If you're a young person who's in their teens, like early teens and children here, you got to figure out how to navigate being with your parents for another 10 years or so. You don't want to, you don't want to stir the boat too much. You got to figure out how to live beautifully in this world, all of us. We ask God for wisdom and he'll give us wisdom. Why? Because it's more important than rubies and gold and treasures, all the things that we could value in this world. My friend, if you don't see from scripture how important wisdom is, if you don't see from the Old Testament of your life how broken you are without the wisdom of God, you're in a bad place. You need to pray for repentance. Really, you do. Because the Bible says you give up gold, you give up rubies, you give up everything for this wisdom that comes from on high. It is more important than anything. Your security, your peace, such as you know it on earth, your vision for your life, the wisdom of heaven is more important. You want to know the craziest thing is that wisdom is not limited to those who have degrees. We have some very smart people in our community. We have, there's very smart people in the world. You want to know, that, you want to know the irony of the, probably who the wisest person in the White House is right now? It's not President Trump, Lord knows, we all know. But you know what it is, it's probably a person, maybe, they, maybe they're just like, what is it? Maybe they're a greeter, they just greet visitors to the White House. Maybe they're a janitor who cleans up at night. But it's the person who has gone before the Lord and asked for wisdom and has wholeheartedly received it. That person is the wisest person in the White House tonight. The wisest person in this church is not, maybe, I don't know, it's probably not somebody, maybe, whatever the percentage, maybe it's not even somebody who's walked up on this stage, but it's a frater or sora that sat in the ranks, sat in the rindur amongst us, and has prayed to God for wisdom, and God has heard them, because God is not stingy. He gives generously of his wisdom to those who ask it of him, for they have sought it more than rubies and gold. They have sought it more than their comfort and safety, and they are the wisest person in our church. And in heaven, maybe we'll know. Maybe God will let us see that. And we'll all shot chuckle and be like, huh, of course it was. Didn't see it. Are we going to enjoy sin? Are we going to enjoy living compromised lives? To not give over space to the Lord to make us wise? Are we going to keep rebuilding the houses? Are we going to keep throwing furniture in an empty lot and call it a home? There's a thing my dad told me like three years ago. Sorry to put you on the spot, Dad. He said, and I, I, this will be when Dad is long gone, la domno. The greatest thing, he, one of the greatest things he ever taught me, he said, Jonathan, if you were to do half of what you know, you would be twice the Christian I am tonight. We were arguing over something. I was arguing with him, rather, over something. And he said that to me. I keep thinking about that every, like, two weeks. Every, it comes up because I'm that foolish. I need a reminder in my heart. If I was just going to do half the things I know about God, if I just took some of that, if I were to just to take from hearing and move to doing, I'd be twice the Christian he ever was. In my eyes, that's a big standard. And in your eyes, in your heart, you have a standard as well. Imagine if you just did half of what you know about how you should live with God. The good news, my friend, if you're a Christian tonight, the good news, if you lack wisdom tonight, we're going to go into a prayer. Is that okay if we go into a prayer? Oh, yeah, sorry. Well, you guys lead it. The good news is that if you leave here tonight, you guys can pray and God will give you wisdom. You can get wisdom that's more precious, that will guard you and keep you and make you wise for this time of COVID and whatever comes after, however many years we have. May God bless us and keep us.